meditation in the Westminster Confession of Faith takes us into the sixth section of chapter three of God's decrees. I'll read the section for you and then make some brief comments on the section itself. As God hath appointed the elect unto glory, so hath he by the eternal and most free purpose of his will foreordained all the means thereunto. Wherefore, they who are elected, being fallen in Adam, are redeemed by Christ, are effectually called unto faith in Christ by his Spirit, working in due season, justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by his power through faith unto salvation. Neither are any other redeemed by Christ effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved, but the elect only. The confession is dealing with that most difficult subject of Scripture, God's election, the choice of the people for himself before the creation of the heavens and the earth. God, according to his good pleasure, by his sovereignty, uh, chose a people for himself, set them apart from the rest of the world, they would be the objects of his love and mercy. He would reveal his grace to them and rescue them from their sins. By the same token, the remainder would be left aside. We'll consider them in the next uh, few meditations. But they would be set aside and they would be the, uh, uh, the signs of God's justice and wrath for sin. But here in focusing on the, those who are God's elect, God sets them apart for himself in eternity past, and then he not only ordains who should be saved in the course of history of time, but also he ordains all of the means by which they will be saved. God has ordained the preaching of the gospel through his servants to bring the message of salvation to his elect. As that gospel spreads throughout the world, God's elect are drawn to Christ. Many pass through this life never hearing the gospel message. Why is that? It was not according to God's purpose. God sends his message where he wills. And so he effects the salvation of his elect in history and time through the various means at his disposal. Therefore God shows that he is a sovereign not only in the choice of his people, but also the means by which they come to faith in Christ. God ordains that we should come to faith in Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit, joining us savingly, powerfully to Christ. We are drawn to Christ in history and time by the Spirit of God. He produces a new life within us, regenerates us, and enables us to see the truth of the gospel, persuades us to embrace Christ with a living faith, persuades us to run to Him as the only hope of salvation. The Spirit produces that within our hearts. He gives us the great gift of faith itself. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians that, gift, uh, that faith is the gift of God. It's not the result of works, lest any man should boast. So God gives us even the very faith that we exercise to believe in Him. That also must come from God. Apart from God working this within us, we will not exercise any faith. And so God not only chooses those who will be His, but he, he ordains all the means there, therefore. He justifies us in Christ, imputing Christ's righteousness to us, taking our sins and placing them on Christ as our Savior. God does that, not we. It is God's work. Sanctification is God's work. He brings you to Christ and daily shows you your sin, brings you to repentance and renewed uh, consecration to Christ as your Lord and you follow after Him in life. And He preserves you in the course of that through the ministry of the gospel, through the, the fellowship of the saints, through the various ways which God works in the world in providence. God brings you safely till He brings you to glorification. When Christ returns and judges all mankind and brings us safely into His eternal course, God accomplishes it all from first to last. He ordains who should be saved, and He also ordains the means whereby we should be saved. Now, when we consider the great sovereignty of God in our salvation, the question arises, well, what about my responsibility? What 
should I do? Do I just sit back and wait for God to act? What we are talking about is what God is doing in many respects under the surface of history and time. What we see is the actions that we take. We are called upon to believe. We are called upon to act upon the promises of the gospel. We are called upon to respond to the grace of Christ. And we must respond to that offer. Except we will, if we don't, we will perish. And so we must act as though everything depends on me. Except I trust in Christ. Except I believe the gospel. I will perish. But the end result is, if you do in fact come to Christ, if you do receive the forgiveness of your sins, if you do have eternal life within your heart, it's because God has brought it all about sovereignly, secretly, wonderfully, in ways which produce His own praise and glory. When you've come to faith in Christ, you realize that it was all of God's grace. And not of your own works. If left to yourself, you would continue in your own ways. One more thought in, in commentary on this section, and that is this. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all work in unison towards your salvation. They have one common plan, one common objective. So if the Father chooses the people for himself and commits them to Christ, Christ does not then go to the cross and die for all men whatsoever without regard to the Father's own specific plan of choosing a certain people. The Son's work on the cross is consistent with the Father's sovereign election. He goes to the cross to accomplish the Father's will and the salvation of the elect. By the same token, the Holy Spirit, when He comes into the world to bring us to Christ, brings only those for whom Christ died, only those whom God the Father has chosen. There is not a division or a, a conflict in the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are many today who suggest that Christ died for all men indiscriminately, and that all can be saved. Well, His death is sufficient to save all men, but the purpose is to save the elect. And Christ specifically atones for their sins at the cross. And the Spirit applies that death only to those whom the Father has chosen, and brings them sovereignly and graciously to Christ. Otherwise, you have a great conflict. Christ dies for all men, but the Spirit only saves some. What's going on? The Son intended to save everybody in the world, but the Spirit says, no, I'll just save a few here and there. You would have a great conflict between the members of the Trinity. You would destroy the unity of the Trinity. It's one sovereign plan, one united plan. The Father sets apart a people to Christ joins them to Christ, Christ dies for them at the cross, pays the full penalty for all their sins, then in history and time the Spirit brings them, searches them out in history and time, brings them to Christ, enables them to embrace Christ in living faith, and they will ultimately be saved. And so you see as the confession talks about there will be not any more added to that, none subtracted to that, God's purpose will be accomplished. He which began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. This message is not to frighten anyone, but to comfort the elect, to comfort God's people in knowing that God has done it all. He's ordained your salvation if you're converted to Christ, He will also ordain your sanctification and your glorification. It will come to pass. Despite your weakness, despite your frailties, your many sins, God is on your side. As Paul says in Romans 8, if God be for us, who can be against us?